Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this panel discussion around the past, the present, and the future of preprints. Thank you uh, all of you for uh, being here. I see that we have quite a few people uh, joining. Um, so I'll give it a few seconds uh, while we have the participants join uh, the virtual room for this panel discussion. Um, something that I wanted to mention uh, briefly, uh, well, I'm obviously I'm uh, Iratsa Problem uh, Associate Director for ASA Bio, and I wanted to mention that I'm particularly thrilled about this uh, panel discussion uh, because it is actually the result of the efforts of a number of fellows from the ASA Bio Fellows Program, which we are running for the first time this year. Uh, they have also created a hashtag for the event that you can see there on the slide, so feel free to live tweet about what we will be discussing uh, here today. Okay, so uh, to get us started, um, something I was uh, we wanted to do was run a few uh, brief polls with all of you, um, just to get a little bit of a sense as to who is in this again virtual room today. So I'm going to be uh, launching the polls through the. Um, uh, some functionality. Uh, you will be seeing three brief questions. Uh, the first one relates to uh, a little bit of information about what your role is. Uh, again, a researcher, uh, perhaps a publisher, librarian, etc. Uh, a little bit of information about how many preprints have you posted, um, uh, or if you have done so. Uh, and then we are hoping that you could tell us what your area of research is. So I'll be launching the poll. And if you can, uh, uh, please take a few seconds to go over that while I will uh, touch on a few housekeeping items. Um, so the first uh, item I wanted to mention is that we are recording this session because we would like to make it available uh, after the event. Um, we are going to be running an agenda where we are going to be hearing from our chairs uh, and each of the panelists. There is going to be a roundtable discussion with the panelists, and then we will make sure that we keep time towards the end for questions from the audience. And towards that, um, we would ask that you please use the Q&A uh, functionality that you should see on the Zoom screen at the bottom right. Uh, please add any questions um, that you may want to pose to the panelists. The functionality is open all throughout the event, so just as you think of a question that you may like to post, please type it there. We will be keeping an eye on that. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we will be uh, taking questions from there and posting those to the panelists in the last part of the event. So I can see that a number of you have uh, responded to the polling questions. So I'm going to now uh, close the polls. And uh, I was going to briefly uh, share the results with you. So hopefully you can now all see that on your screen. Um, we have a, a nice distribution of uh, roles here, but uh, quite a bit of representation uh, from editors and uh, publishing organization staff. Um, majority of uh, those present has not posted a, a preprint, but I can see that several have, which is good to see. Uh, and in terms of discipline distribution, uh, majority from the life sciences, which is probably not surprising given that that's the focus that we're gonna have today. today. We're going to be discussing mostly preprints in the life sciences. So thank you so much uh, for participating in these polls. I will close that now. Um, and with that, I'm going to be handing over to the chairs who are Yamini Ravichandran from Institute Pasteur and Institute Curie in France, and Marco Fumasoni from Harvard University in the US. And they are going to uh, get started with an introduction into the topic for today. Over to you. Thank you, Ratse, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, so let's all kick off with a brief overview. Uh, could, could we have the next slide, Jessica? Yeah, so what exactly is a preprint? A preprint is a version of a scientific article preceding its uh, peer, -reviewed, uh, peer review process and its scholarly publication. The advantage of preprints -pre is that they are easily accessible to the scientific community and therefore can receive feedback, various ideas and discussions based on them. 
And this process takes less than 48 hours compared to the traditional uh, peer reviewed and publication. Followed by this, when, yeah, we could go to the next slide, Jessica, yeah. So when, uh, when did preprints begin? Preprints began uh, that dating back to 1961 as, uh, as groups uh, such as uh, information exchange groups, which were established to share scientific articles uh, and also the establishment of preprint servers such as Archive in 1991 and HAL Archives in 2001 and also initiatives such as Nature Proceedings. Let's have a look at what is the current uh, usage of preprints uh, today. Over the past decade, several, several uh, preprint servers have been established and, the, and they put out several preprints as you can see uh, represented in this graph. And uh, several organizations, which uh, we'll see now, have also adopted preprint policies. Preprint policies, thank you. But still, uh, to date, only 8% of the articles that we put out are, uh, are actually initi initially start out as preprints. In addition to that, one such initiative which has uh, adopted preprints uh, currently is that of the PubMed uh, preprint policy. Yes, that of the PubMed preprint pilot. More information on the, on the usage of preprints in the past and their current usage will be given by Richard Server later on in this discussion. In addition to this, let's hear more about uh, preprints and their current usage from my co-chair, Marco. Thank you, Yamini. Uh, now that uh, you introduced the fast rise of usage of preprints over time, uh, I'm here to uh, ruin a little bit the party by showing how this rise uh, hasn't been always like very homogeneous. And uh, for instance, um, in, the, in the slides, we see like a, a global heat map uh, that refers to the number of preprints available on BioArchive uh, by the country of the corresponding author. And we see that is uh, far from being uniform. And I would like to emphasize the fact that the heat bar is on a logarithmic scale. So the difference between orange and red is, is pretty big. And on this, I would like to share a, a personal view, hopefully to prime a discussion later on. Uh, that is like, I can, kind of fear that a differential adoption of such a revolutionary tool uh, as the preprint that is very likely to accelerate uh, uh, science may you know, enlarge a sort of like technological or scientific gap that already exists between different geographical areas. And I wonder if something could be done actively to prevent this, for instance. Um, if you go to the next slide instead, uh, we see that another interesting asymmetry uh, regarding preprints uh, is the one uh, that refers to how different uh, disciplines are posting preprints. Uh, in these slides, you see uh, the share of preprints, again, available on BioArchive in 2019 by the field uh, that contributed it. And what is striking is that almost, I don't know if you see the bar, the X axis, but almost 20% of the preprint uh, seems to be contributed by neuroscience. And so this data is not normalized by the size of a field. Uh, but at the same time, I refuse to believe that molecular biology, for instance, is such a tiny fraction compared to neuroscience. So this seems to suggest that different fields seems to be more or less likely to post preprints. And again, it's interesting to ask why this is happening. And again, if something could be done to sort of normalize the uh, preparing culture across disciplines. Um, in the next slides instead, uh, to conclude this very short presentation, we will just would like to mention some of the most exciting initiatives that started to gravitate around the universe of preparing. And the first referred to uh, some independent um, initiatives to organize, perform, and associate scientific peer review made by scientists to the preprints that are available uh, on the servers. Uh, while the second one, uh, if you can click next, Jessica, we see that there are also journal clubs or um, commentaries that are run uh, independently by the community um, on preprints with the aim of sometimes highlighting a very interesting preprints to the scientific community or to provide the authors um, with uh, useful feedback before, before publication. So now these slides is not intended to be comprehensive and uh, 
uh, there are other initiatives on, on addition to this and we would like to encourage people uh, to just look them up on, online and maybe we have time to discuss them uh, later and uh, that is it for the introduction and in the next slide uh, Yamini is going to introduce you with a diverse group of panelists with whom we're going to discuss this. Thank you Marco. So today we have uh, five panelists amongst us representing different um, stakeholders who are involved with preprint usage. First, we have Anjana Badrina Ryan, who is a principal investigator at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, India. And we would like to hear more about her experience with preprints. Over to you, Anjana. Thanks. Uh, let me start by thanking Yamini, Marco, and um, Asa Bio for putting together this very um, timely and important uh, panel and session. Um, so what I thought I'll do is really briefly tell you about um, my background uh, and then tell you about why uh, preprints matter for us as a, a really young research group and also more broadly why I think they are an important and integral part of what the future of, of life sciences should look like. Um, okay, so uh, could I request for the next slide, please? Uh, my lab is based here in this really um, beautiful looking campus. It's the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India, so that's the south of India. Um, we are a research only campus, uh, about 35 uh, faculty who work on diverse areas of biology and my lab is a, a microbiology lab. I started here about three and a half years ago now. Um, and um, next slide, please, Jessica, thank you. Um, and we sort of study uh, aspects of DNA damage uh, response and repair in microbial systems using uh, microscopy and cell biology as our uh, sort of main uh, focus area. Right, so that's about my lab and how um, young we are. And over the past uh, few years, uh, we've done some initial work trying to get on our feet. And I realized that, you know, starting a lab is, um, is, a, is a challenging process. And um, several times you wonder, how are you going to get your work out there to the community and, and get feedback on, on, on what you're doing, right? And how can you get that happen to happen quickly? Um, and share your work openly so that people can actually see it and, um, and um, use it as well as, as respond to it. So um, these are two examples of preprints that have come out of my lab. We are N of two and both of them are on preprint servers and are at various stages of uh, revisions and reviews. Um, but the great thing is that it's out there. The work is out there and it can be seen and shared and read by people. Um, uh, if I can just ask you to click once, Jessica. Thank you. Right. So what um, what 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 these this this uh, preprint uh, sort of uh, server has helped us do? Both of these are bioarchive. We've used bioarchive for this. Is that we managed to share our work rather rapidly with the community. Um, in the in in one of our preprints, for example, the second one, uh, we even received feedback from uh, labs. They did a journal club um, on our paper. Uh, they wrote up a nice review, they sent it to us, um, and we were able to then make fixes and update the manuscript. In fact, the updating system itself is so streamlined and easy that we were able to make revisions and get the, 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 the newer version of our paper up um, rapidly um, into, into the preprint server. And so that's really great, right? So uh, in some ways, it was a very nice feeling to see that we could get our work out there, we could get feedback on it, um, even get cited from the preprint itself, which is also um, really quite exciting um, and reassuring for a very young lab to, to have. Um, what we also found is that, you know, it really streamlined submissions. So both of our papers went into review after posting on the preprint server. And it was, it was a one click system to get it out to review. And that is very, very quick um, and saves a lot of time. And I find that um, also is really helpful. You don't have to change formats to suit every single journal you want to send to. It's the most many journals, as you will hear in the rest of the, the panel, accept preprints as a, a, a method of submission. Um, and again, as a, as, a, as a speaking from a young grant, I'm sure senior PIs also have similar feelings. You get to cite these works in grants and reports, and it's not sort of this abstract thing that's sitting out there in your head somewhere or buried under a desk. You get to put it in a report and say, hey, look, I did something. And 
it's out there. You can go have a look at it and, and judge for yourself whether it's a solid piece of work. And that's really, really nice um, to have um, happen for, for, for us. So it, it, um, as, a, as a young lab, it gets us to have a lot of confidence in doing what we're doing. And um, my experience so far has been fantastic. And so we're going to keep using preprints as a way of sharing our work um, with the community. Uh, more generally with how do we use preprints in, in the institute and in, in the lab, when I'm training students, for example, we end up doing journal clubs on preprints. It's a great way of seeing how a paper evolves over time. Um, and so we also get to understand the, the review process using this system. And um, I, I really do find that this is a really open and constructive process of sharing science um, without waiting months uh, before work comes out you get to actually see it out there um, and, 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 and know what's going on you know, in, in, in the, the field you're in. So yeah, that's, that's it from me uh, about preprints. Thank you. Thank you, Anjana. Um, so the next panelist is Ross Mounds, um, Director of Open Access Programs at Arcadia Fund. Thank you. Um, if we could move on to my next slide, please. Um, I'd just like to say everyone, it's International Open Access Week today. Um, well, this all this week, so we can celebrate that. And um, preprints are a great way of achieving um, access to your work and sharing it with the world without a paywall. So that's a very good thing about preprints. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize with this slide is that um, there's a huge diversity of preprint servers out there. I think often when we talk about preprints, we end up just talking about bioarchive. And actually, it's more than just bioarchive. So from my perspective, as a, from a paleontology background, um, there's actually a surfeit of options out there. There's kind of subject specific options like the Earth and Space Sciences um, preprint archive, paleo archive, Earth archive, eco evo archive. Then there's the kind of regional preprint servers that cover either a particular country or a particular region. So you've got India archive, Cielo preprints, Africa Archive, RIN Archive, the preprint server for Indonesia, China Archive. Um, there's lots of different preprint servers out there. And at the moment, it, it's not actually that easy to search across them. So um, there's a kind of a future development that's needed to make it easier for readers to actually read more than just bioarchive preprints. Um, but yeah, there, there's a huge diversity of options out there. Um, I'd like to particularly to talk about Earth Archive and RIN Archive. Earth, Earth Archive is really cool because um, it's open source, it's based upon Janeway technology, and it's now hosted at California Digital Library. Um, and likewise, RIN Archive, the preprint server of Indonesia, is also open source, uh, based upon Open Preprint Server, which is a PJ, uh, PJP uh, OJS technology. Um, so it's great that we've got open source, open science infrastructure, and not all the preprint servers are actually behind the scenes. Um, if I could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to pick out Africa Archive um, just for some attention, because I think what they're doing is really interesting. Um, it's almost transcended um, being a, an actual preprint server itself, and it, instead it's more of a meta preprint server going across various different repositories, trying to collect together scholarship produced by African scholars or, or about Africa. And it's really fascinating because it's both uh, multilingual and de decentralized. It takes from OSF preprints, Zenodo, um, PubPub, Science Open. And I think what they're doing is really interesting and really ambitious. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's just a little anecdote of the power of preprints. Um, I'm, I'm afraid it's not a very beautiful slide, but I do think it is, it, it is important. Um, so timeliness is really, really important for getting your research out. I spotted this preprint on BioArchive and I thought it was fantastic because basically the key result from this paper is that 50% of um, conservation biologists do not have adequate access to the research literature. So this is very important for open access policy. And it just so happened that this preprint got posted just before two major um, US and UK government open access policy consultations. So I was able to include the results from this preprint in uh, Arcadia Fund's response to these, these governments, the US government and the, um, the UK government through these policy processes. And if they, if they hadn't put a preprint out and waited until the journal published it, it was published in PeerJ in an open access journal, it would have been too late. Um, so actually getting, getting your research out there early 
uh, actually makes a big difference and you can actually make it in time for it to be useful in the real world world if it, if it was released in June or July only in June or July it would have missed these two big deadlines these two big policy consultations um, next slide please Um, also, as a reader and as a former researcher myself, um, I really enjoy preprint servers because um, there's so much to do. It's like Wikipedia almost. I mean, you can um, read a preprint and you can really find some helpful things to, to give feedback on. Um, and I have a much better experience, uh, more positive experience of giving feedback on preprints um, relative to journal articles. I mean, you try and correct a journal article and if the authors and editor can even be bothered, they might do something. But um, Whereas in my experience, the authors of preprints are actually really, really receptive to, to comments and, and, and improvements. And just in general, uh, moving over to the culture of versioning and having um, research not as the, the final object, but actually just a, con a continuing series of versions, I think is a much healthier way to view research and that research isn't necessarily ever final. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Ross. We couldn't agree more. It's true, uh, research is a continuum. Not, there's nothing final. Uh, with that, let's move on to our next uh, panelist, who is uh, Saumya Swami Swaminathan, uh, who's uh, the head of editorial policy and research integrity at uh, Nature, Nature Research. Let's hear more from her. Thanks, Yamini. Um, and uh, thank you to ASAM Bio for pulling together this um, session. Um, I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion. I think already some of the themes raised are, are very spot on. Um, and, you know, preprints are so central at the moment right now as we're moving through the pandemic. Um, next slide. Um, so I think most of you know Nature Research as a portfolio of um, journals, in particular the Nature branded journals, but also a very large group now of open access journals. But as Yamini mentioned in her introductory slide, um, we launched um, a, a, a preprint server focused on the life science community in 2007, and it was in many ways a very forward looking step at the time. The server um, you know, had a number of the features that we take for granted today in preprint servers. Um, next slide, please. So Nature and Nature Research Journals have supported preprint sharing um, as early as 1997. That was our first editorial, supporting preprint sharing and citation of preprints and research articles. And this was really motivated by the view that we believe that preprints accelerate sharing of research findings and they complement the journal peer review process. In 2019, we expanded and updated our preprint policy to encourage preprint sharing for research articles and to provide more information and detail about the preprint policy, particularly in areas that we felt was really important to further responsible uptake of preprints. So for example, we support preprint citation in research articles, we support CC BY licensing, and we support responsible communication with the media. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to tell you about two initiatives that focus on how our journals are interacting with preprints. The first one called In Review is a Springer Nature wide initiative. It focuses on integrating preprint posting with journal submission and peer review. And the goal of this initiative is to really support researchers across Springer Nature. So we publish something on the order of 340,000. Um, articles a year across a very wide range of research disciplines. And the goal is to support our researchers across the span of Springer Nature to be able to share, discuss, and cite early findings. Um, the initiative launched in 2018 as a pilot on four BMC journals and was developed in partnership with our partners, Research Square, who provide the preprint platform and technology. Um, and the, the entire system is really integrated with the journal submission and peer review process. So when authors 
submit to a journal, they can opt in to have their preprint deposited on the Research Square platform. The preprint is deposited after it undergoes uh, a minimum set of quality control checks. The preprint is generally available on the platform in XML. It gets a DOI, so it's citable, and it's open for community feedback through commenting and annotation on the Research Square platform. Um, all the preprints are available with CC BY licensing. And in fact, CC BY is the only form of licensing that's available on the platform. And the platform is also enabled to provide additional metrics information about the preprint. For example, um, uh, the attention the preprint might be getting on social media, um, as well as citation information. Next slide, please. So as I said, it launched as a pilot on four BMC journals, but we have an ambition to offer in review across Springer Nature. It's now available at 328 journals. This is actually data from August, so it's already a little bit out of date. But we're seeing an aggregate opt-in of about 37% across Springer Nature journals. Um, and back in August, we had about 38,000 preprints already posted that had come, that had been brought in through this initiative. Um, a couple of interesting bits about what we're seeing in terms of discipline. Uh, if I could get that, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jessica. Um, we're seeing, actually, we're seeing uptake across a broad range of disciplines, um, including, for example, the humanities and social sciences, chemistry, we're seeing very high uptake around 50%. The other interesting um, trend that we're seeing right now in aggregate form across Springer Nature is we're seeing very high percent of total opt-in um, from corresponding authors with labs based in China. So that's actually quite interesting compared to what we're seeing on BioArchive. We don't fully understand the basis for that, but it, it is what the data is showing us. So InReview is also available across the Nature Research Journals. We launched in June 2020. It's now available across all 39 uh, Nature Branded Journals, as well as the Communications Journals. We are in the process of gathering data and looking at the trends. But I think what I can already tell you right now is that um, uptake looks healthy. Um, across the board, it's the initiative has been very positively received by our authors. It's different from a preprint platform in being integrated with the peer review process and the submission system. So authors are also in fact getting some real time update into the progression of the peer review process. So in addition to facilitating preprint deposition, it provides authors with a huge degree of transparency into the peer review process. So that's, that's another very key differentiator of, of in review. Um, next slide, please. So this next initiative I'd like to tell you about is an initiative um, that launched in April 2020, very much in response to the ra very rapidly evolving preprint literature. Uh, for preprint literature, particularly focused on, on COVID-19, and very much also as a response to the what became very clear, the changing behavior of particular research communities in terms of how they share information and how they consume the literature. So this is an initiative in place at Nature Reviews Immunology. It is a collaboration with the Sinai Immunology Review Project and the Oxford COVID-19 Literature Review Initiative. These are both academic groups um, uh, composed of early career researchers, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty who review the COVID-19 literature. So the academic groups select the preprints, uh, review the preprints, and then they provide an additional sort of level of selectivity by out of those reviewed pre COVID-19 preprints, a select few are then summarized in the form of the so-called in brief highlight, which is a very short 
distillation of the key findings of the study. And then this in brief highlight is published in Nature Reviews Immunology. So in the last, you know, from April to October, the journal has published about 67 in brief pieces, around 12 a month. Um, and I, again, as I said, um, this initiative really evolved out of a desire to help filter what was this very growing and rapidly uh, uh, evolving treatment literature, so as a service to readers. But I think what's also very nice about it, since a lot of this review work is actually being done by graduate students and postdocs, is that the highlight and the publication of the highlight also provides credit and recognition for the ECRs who are involved in the peer review of the COVID-19 literature. Um, and I, you know, this is this is phase one of the initiative. Um, and um, we're certainly poised to looking at learning from this initiative and looking at how it can evolve. Next slide, please. So I think in this last slide, I just wanted to um, highlight, talk very briefly about what I feel are the challenges and opportunities in the preprint space. Um, I think discovery is a enormous challenge. There's a, as, as Ross said, there's a huge, huge number of preprint servers and they're growing. And certainly there are some, some uh, um, engines out there that can search across uh, platforms, but discovery still, is, it's a work in progress. And I think the other aspect of discovery that we're really only beginning to scratch the surface of is how do you filter? I mean, the literature is growing, right? And it's growing and growing. Some of these preprints are actually being enriched, but how do you actually filter meaningfully? Um, equity in my mind is again, a huge issue, I think. Preprints really create the opportunity for a very democratic uh, and essentially democratize the, the uh, the scholarly communication space. On the other hand, how are preprints being surfaced and, and how are preprints then being selected out for greater amplification on social media, in terms of the commenting they receive, and to what extent is the community falling back on, well, very established and entrenched notions of quality and value. I think that um, it's a very exciting space right now. There's a lot going on, as Marco said, around assessment of preprints. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there for collaboration across the different stakeholders. And I, I think, in fact, some of these issues around discovery and equity can really only be addressed through collaboration and cooperation in this space. Enrichment. So I, I am uh, very interested in transparency and reproducibility. And um, what's very exciting is also a number of automated developments. And I've put up uh, a little bit on, that, on my slide there about the automated screening working groups. So a number of automated developments and tools that are actually focusing attention on the preprint. So really moving upstream of journal submission and peer review um, to provide feedback on various aspects of a study, common problems uh, that, that also address aspects of transparency and reproducibility. And I think that is actually a development that can help uh, address the discovery issue potentially to some extent as well, particularly if it becomes something like a quality filter. So I think with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Somnia. Um, the next panelist then is uh, Antonis Rokas. It is professor and chair of biological sciences at Vanderbilt uh, University. Thank you, Marco, and uh, thank you, Yamini, and thank you to the um, ASAP Bio Fellows Program for, for the invitation. I'm gonna share uh, a little bit of information about um, what, what do I do and my role in preprints. And so, uh, as it was said, I'm a professor of biological sciences and I'm on the senior end of things. I've been uh, here since 2007 for, for a good number of years. And then I also direct the Evolutionary Studies Initiative 
I'm at uh, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, which is uh, Music City, USA. And so um, one of my graduate students uh, was inspired by Music City, USA and created these nice posters about what we do in our lab. We're an evolutionary genomics lab studying uh, fungi and also the evolution of human pregnancy. And um, it turns out, you know, looking at the slides that um, the, the fellows put uh, as an introduction, it turns out we were one of the relatively early adopters in, in our field, at least. Uh, we've been posting our manuscripts as preprints since 2015. And about nine out of 10 of our manuscripts nowadays that we produce appear as, as preprints. Um, next slide. So um, we had a, a lab meeting discussion on preprints this, this past Friday of, you know, why do we use it? Why we, do we do this? And I think the, the bottom line or one of the major bottom lines is that um, it really helps us disseminate our work. So my, my graduate students, my postdocs, my undergrads, uh, when they do research in the lab, they work incredibly hard and they want, and I want for them, the maximum visibility for their research. Uh, they want their research to be useful. They want it to be read. They want it to be cited. And so when you look at the statistics of papers um, that have appeared as preprints relative to papers of the, the similar appearing at the same time, but that haven't appeared as preprints, what you do see is that um, you get more citations if your papers appear as preprints and that the effect is immediate. So it, it, it happens relatively quickly, but it's also long lasting. And then um, I think Anjana mentioned that um, you get valuable feedback, which is always great. And because it's early in the process, very often you avoid sort of these uncomfortable conversations about published articles that, you know, had you didn't cite a person or you didn't do a particular test that somebody really wanted you to do. And so it offers a really easy and intuitive way to correct these things or to address some of these issues um, without sort of it being, being uncomfortable. And, you know, just one of the, the main discussions that we had on sort of uh, as, as food for thought is, you know, how do we ensure as, as more and more of us put more and more preprints, um, right? If, if we compare preprints to the, the internet, you know, how do we ensure that it remains a good thing? I think that's, you know, one of our worries as people who use it for, we believe for, for good, you know, how do we ensure that the, the universe of preprints remains uh, good? So next slide, please. So one of my other hats is that um, as, a, as a senior investigator, I'm on the editorial boards of uh, several different journals. I'm not going to read them all. Um, the two comments I want to make is that all of these journals accept uh, preprints, and then these journals span a wide range of um, publishers, such as societies like the Genetic Society of America or the Public Library of Science, um, all the way to companies like Elsevier and Cell Press and Springer Nature and, and so on and, and so forth. And so they, they span a wide range. Uh, next slide, please. And um, all of these journals, as, as I said, are really welcoming. Um, I found in my experience, one of the journals that sort of um, on the most innovative edge uh, with respect to preprints is a journal called eLife that's uh, funded and sponsored by many foundations such as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, the Max Planck uh, Society, the Wellcome Trust in Britain um, and, and several other foundations and funding bodies. Um, and one of the recent initiatives that they've launched is this um, preprint review. And so in the study process, you submit your paper to eLife and you have um, an initial discussion among the senior editors on whether to invite the paper for review or, or reject it straight up. Um, nowadays, we're trying this pilot of um, reviewing, peer reviewing the manuscript without the, the initial screening by the senior editors. And the journal's commitment is that they'll ensure that you get three, four reviews and the summary, um, and summary statement for, for your paper. The commitment on the, the uh, end of the, on the author's end is that these, um, reviews will be posted online on, on BioArchive. And so the journal commits that they'll openly and transparently review your article and you commit that um, you will uh, uh, accept posting the, the reviews. And one of the issues that Wright has sort of over the years 
troubled journals or makes you know jobs of uh, associate editors difficult or editors is that right many times um, people don't like the reviews and then they take them to a different journal and you know they take them to a few different journals and so we hope this is sort of a way to potentially curtail this behavior and ensure that you know articles are evaluated on their merit and uh, we avoid sort of bad actors sort of shopping their uh, their article in many different places. And so I'll, I'll stop there and um, uh, pass it on to uh, the uh, chairs again. Thank you so much uh, for that, Antonis. Um, also sharing the new uh, eLife initiative. And uh, next we have uh, Richard Server, who is uh, the assistant director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press and also the co-founder of uh, two preprint servers such as uh, which are MedArchive and BioArchive. Over to you, Richard. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I think a lot of what I was gonna say has been covered, so I'll move quite quickly. So um, uh, Jessica, if you can be quick on the trigger, that would be great. So next slide, please. Okay, so looking at the, uh, the from the past through to the future, I think you know you have to give credit to Archive for really showing the way for everybody. Um, Archive started in 1991, a non-profit um, server, um, which has more than a million preprints, um, and this was really an inspiration for us. Um, you know, I think they over those 30 years, we still know that computers still work, math and physics still function effectively, so preprints have not been chaotic. Um, which is something that is often claimed. So uh, next, next slide, please. So uh, yeah, as I say, they're an inspiration for us. Um, and in 2013, we launched BioArchive really to complement um, Archive and bring this practice to biology. Um, again, it's a not, it's a nonprofit. Um, and um, we, we had some additional features which we thought would um, uh, make it appeal to, to biologists. And uh, next slide. Um, and, and, and essentially the um, biomedical community has voted with their feet. This is a curve from last year um, showing exponential growth of bioarchive. The new papers are the, is the blue curve and the revised papers are the red curve. Um, at this point now we have, um, we just this weekend tipped over 100,000 papers on bioarchive, which is really pretty uh, phenomenal. And as I say, I think um, uh, uh, scientists are voting with their feet on that. Um, so next slide, please. And what was interesting is, so, you know, having launched BioArchive in 2013, after that, there was really, um, uh, you know, an explosion of, of interest in this area and a whole bunch of non-profit, largely discipline specific preprint servers emerged in areas like chemistry, sports science, social science, archive. Um, and it, it was really interesting to, to, see, to see these uh, emerge um, immediately after uh, BioArchive was, was launched. And, and, you know, uh, many of these have been very successful. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings us to the present. And I think one of the things that we, we've seen with BioArchive is that the promise of its feeding up research really has happened. This is just a tweet from Michael Hoffman talking about how you know, he, he was blown away because people are finding the disseminating research as, as Ross said, after sort of a couple of days means that people can start talking about it immediately and people can start building on this research immediately. And there are now numerous examples of this one on aggregate, the, um, the effect obviously um, could be considerable. I was interested to hear that um, uh, Prachia Basti, who's the new president of ASAP Bio, just earlier today tweeted, she said, I can't imagine science without this. And I think that's really a sort of testament to the, the, the success of the idea in, in, in the field that some, the scientists are really finding that it, 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 it's working for them. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so we, um, yeah, sorry, I'm just getting an apology from um, Jessica. It seems like there's a delay um, with the slides. Um, so, you know, uh, when, we, when we come to today in 2019, we launched a med archive um, with BMJ and Yale. Um, and this was intended to complement a bio archive, but recognize the fact that, you know, there are some additional concerns in, in, with clinical information and there are other things you are about. So we have an all, all preprints are screened on bioarchive. This process is um, enhanced on that archive, and there are some additional checks that go on. So, next slide. And I, this has been underscored by the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, we've now got thousands of preprints on COVID 19 across bioarchive and med archive, and that's really significant when you compare it to um, the first SARS epidemic in 2003, when the vast majority of papers. 
um, appeared only after the epidemic had ended. Um, you know, Zika, people were beginning to get the hang of this um, with bioarchive, but it's been phenomenal in COVID-19. And there's some amazing work that's coming out. Next slide, please. Um, you, can, you can see this is evident from the growth of Met Archive. Um, in the, in towards the end, of, we launched midway through 2019. You see the last six months of last year, we had the sort of slow but steady growth of the kind we'd experienced when Bioarchive was launched in 2013. And then come January 19th, we saw this explosion um, as, as, as basically as the um, SARS-CoV-2 epidemic um, took hold. We, we've got a huge number of papers coming in from China and elsewhere in the world, and it really exploded. So it showed that it was really meeting a, a, a need uh, for rapid dissemination of clinical information as well as biological information. So next slide, please, Jessica. And what was interesting is that some of these, um, some of these papers, again, are, are seeing a million people view them. The, the um, readership is going beyond experts. And so there was clearly a need for people to get context and more information about them. And what was, what was fantastic is the way that the scientific community has step, step, uh, stepped up and self-organized in response to this. And I think this is important as we think of what publishing is going to look like in the future. So Mount Sinai Group here in New York, uh, University of Oxford Immunology Network, and um, the Hopkins uh, novel coronavirus research approach um, basically created discussion groups where they were doing very rapid uh, review of these preprints, which is which is which is very, very interesting. So next slide, please. So I think as we think about how this points the way forward for the future, um, we've always thought of the idea that bioarchive and medarchive should be thought of as a utility. A utility that decouples the um, dissemination and the subsequent ev evaluation of, uh, of a preprint, but also a number of other things. So obviously, you know, there are Google's, and people have talked earlier, um, earlier, uh, earlier um, speakers have talked about discovery Things like Meta, Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic are all indexing preprints. So we want to enable these um, and make the information discoverable, which it is now. We also provide a home for uh, confirmatory and contradictory results, which you know frequently people have claimed uh, journals aren't interested in. So that's you know enabling the uh, re reproducibility and enabling discussion and linking to discussions be they in the bioarchive comments section or Twitter, blogs, annotation, new tools, and then obviously ultimately journals. We have lots of interactions with journals sending papers to and from. Um, so that's how we really, we, we really see um, it as a utility currently. Uh, so next slide please, Jessica. Um, and, and, and this decoupling does promote uh, innovation. Some of these um, uh, initiatives have been mentioned earlier, but I'll just point out a few uh, pre lights from the company Biologist is essentially a news and views for preprints, which is enabled by the existence of bioarchive and med archive. Uh, similarly, portable peer review initiatives like PCR and Re Review Commons, that uh, are groups that we, we interact with. Archivist and, and Meta are more uh, algorithmic approaches to, to ranking, and so um, providing the kind of filtering that Sami mentioned earlier. And then and again, um, ways of um, looking at content automatically and telling readers things about them. For example, like Jet Fighter, which tells you whether or not the, the, um, whether or not the figures can be viewed by somebody who's colorblind, uh, and SciScore, which does something similar. And then I've got to sort of watch this space market here because I think we'll see a lot of initiatives in this area that help to enrich preprints, tell us things about them and have filtering. So next slide, please, Jessica. So this decoupling that I mentioned of the preprint and um, the evaluation that, that is enabled by preprints is, is probably best typified by um, the TRIP project. We have transparent review in preprints. And what this does is it shows a peer review alongside um, a bioarchive preprint. But this peer review is not from bioarchive, it's from another organization, um, eLife or EMBO. So the, the decoupling is preserved because the, the um, the pane circled on the right is not actually part of bioarchive. It's a hypothesis technology window, which is essentially owned by EMBO and ELOC. So it preserves the decoupling of dissemination and review, but it puts them so that e one is easily discoverable by a, a reader. And I think this is a, a, something to think of as we think about how the system is going to evolve. Next slide, please. And finally, just to say, I think it's all these things, um, they really do point the way forward to um, uh, an ecosystem where we can actually have better peer review and better um, 
ways of evaluating, evaluating that manuscript because of this decoupling. And I'd encourage people to take a look at this paper in PNES that Marsha McNutt, Fiona Kierma from PLOS, myself and Kathleen or Jameson wrote about better trust signals for scientific information where we talk about greater transparency, um, badges on content, um, uh, uh, identity verif verification and a whole bunch of different forms of checks that could actually augment and improve, improve peer review. And so I think that's what my aspiration for frequency is, is to get us to a, a situation where we have better peer review ultimately and better trust signals on scientific information. So that's all for me, thanks. Thank you, Richard. And thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing your, your views on preprints. That was really interesting. Um, I guess at this point we can stop um, sharing slides, Jessica. Uh, I think it's time to virtually sit uh, at the round table and discuss among each other uh, some of this topic further. Uh, before doing that, I would like to uh, unleash the audience in, uh, in asking questions in the Q&A section down below. Um, as you can see, the panelists today cover a wide range of expertise, so like all sorts of questions are welcome. And second, don't be shy. Uh, you can type whatever. And at the end, um, Sarah is going to anonymously read these questions to the panelists. So uh, like, don't be afraid. Um, having said that, uh, we can move so to some of the questions that we have cured to prime this discussion. And uh, we may um, ask the question to some of you panelists to start with. But again, I encourage all the panelists to chip in and contribute organically to the discussion. Uh, with the first question, I would like to refer to this sort of potential um, differential adoption across geographical areas that uh, we have mentioned in one of the earlier slides. Uh, I'm interested uh, to hear uh, if you have an opinion about that, in particular, uh, if you have ideas on how, uh, you know, this panorama could be made more uniform across the globe. And looks like Richard has his hands on. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, so I mean, I just want one thing I want to say very quickly when I saw your slide is I mean, you showed the data from a bioarchive for different regions. That's, I think, the first thing that one should do is be aware that if you were to look at journal submissions for most journals, big journals, it would look similar. So you need to be careful what you're drawing a comparison of. I mean, that doesn't mean that the situation that you're describing is not a problem, it just means it's a, it's a bigger problem. So I think there is, you know, there's the general issue of kind of inequities and um, geographical problems with access to and ability to contribute to science. I, but I would be hesitant to think that um, it was a it was a problem exclusive to or caused by preprints. Um, so I mean, I'm hopeful that um, we can address this problem. One of the things that has, has been very interesting in MedArchive in particular is seeing that well, the experience of BioArchive. Um, has been dominated by very prestigious institutions like Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford, the Broad, etc. You see, you know, people have kind of jumped um, on preprints. On MedArchive, it's not so much the case. You're seeing a much um, broader geographical picture. What was very interesting to us was, um, I don't recall seeing uh, sort of vanishing small numbers of papers from China. Um, and then January 19th, we got this explosion and we had this kind of really slightly eerie scenario was looking at the numbers from different different geographical um, regions where the curve for um, submissions to MedArchive from China, then Italy, and then United States almost exactly mimicked the um, infection rate and population of COVID-19. So it was, you know, I think it was, it, it clearly was satisfying a need. There's, there's, there's a need to, to make people aware, I think, is, is, is the main thing. But I think there's lots, of, there's lots of opportunities that have yet to be realized. One of my hopes is that we all know that there's a big global inequity in reviewing our schools. We have this strange position where we simultaneously um, lament the fact that we have reviewer fatigue and nobody can find peer reviewers when the numbers come out that the global south and early career researchers are massively underrepresented. And so one of these, one of my hopes is with this kind of decoupling of review from dissemination, we have an opportunity to really involve all the people who aren't involved and have one problem be the solution to another problem. 
Yep. Uh, uh, j just a quick note regarding the map I showed, uh, I totally agree with you. It's like biased, uh, depending on how many journal submissions there are. And uh, regarding that, uh, so I showed the map just because it was visually more uh, 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 like clearly to, uh, clear to understand. Uh, but the same paper that I, I, I cited at the bottom of the slide had some also normalization compared to the number of uh, total citable documents that are submitted. And I encourage people to look it up because it's really interesting and touch on some of the points that you, that you mentioned. Um, I think uh, Ross also um, had something to say on the, on the... Yeah, I mean, with regards to geographic biases, I think you just got to make sure that you're actually sampling from all of the preprint servers. I think that could be part of the problem as well. I mean, you might have more Chinese uh, um, scientists using China Archive. Um, people feel comfortable using uh, something that comes from their own country. And I, I, I do like the idea of these regional preprint servers. I think, I think it's quite healthy when you think about it. We really want government funders to be getting involved with supporting preprint infrastructure. And I think it's really he healthy that particularly the Indonesian preprint server is actually supported by the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI. Um, I, I think that's really a good thing. And, and I think when you look at bioarchive affiliates, I mean, they don't really show their affiliation, but I got the, I got the feeling that most bioarchive affiliates are either um, based at US or UK labs. So, um, in terms of the social network, I think it does kind of reflect um, the social makeup of the governance for some of these preprint servers. Yeah, just on that point, that it, I mean, it's something we're well aware of. We have a drive going on, which has been going on for a while at, at, at BioArchive to um, basically have make that group of people as diverse as, as possible. It's, you know, anybody who tries to do this, it, it's an effort that takes that takes time. But I think that's a good, uh, uh, that's an important point. I mean, we've always, you know, you have a, when you grow sort of by word of mouth organically in this way, you do get some odd skewings. Um, and it's definitely something that we, we want to address and not to, not to be perceived as being US based. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard and uh, Ross. Let's uh, move on to our next question now. We have a very general uh, question that is, um, what, uh, have have all of you encountered um, differences in adoption of preprints within your own communities? Possibly this is more um, directed towards uh, Antonis and Anjana. And uh, what 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 do you think are the um, are the are the reasons for these differences in adoption within your own uh, communities of uh, preprint usage? Antonia, you want to go first, or should I take a step? You should, you should go first, and then I'll follow. Okay. So um, I haven't experienced any. This is a great question. Um, what I've experienced mostly is people who are just not aware of preprints. So, so we collaborate with somebody, and I say, oh, let's post the manuscript as a preprint, and then send it to our favorite journal. And very often, the question will be, what is a preprint? And, and then I have to explain what it is. And then, you know, very quickly they, they, they adopt it. And, you know, what's nice to see is that then they go to their labs and, you know, you can see their labs are starting uh, practicing preprints. So, so that, that has been sort of overall my experience. Um, I, the, the only cases where I've seen folks being um, cagey about releasing a publication, a, a manuscript as a preprint is in cases where they think, you know, this has a shot for one of the, the top shelf journals, if you like, and they feel somehow that releasing it as a preprint loses a little bit of the novelty that a top shelf uh, journal um, would, you know, would, would demand. But um, yeah, I see Sonia uh, shaking her head. <laughs> and that, that's my experience too, is that you know, as far as I can tell, I, I've, I've never experienced, um, I've disagreed many times with decisions of top shelf journals, but I don't feel like it's driven by whether our manuscript is out as a preprint or, or not. It's, it's, you know, it has to do with other reasons. Um, but that's sort of, you know, that, 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 that's the, the summary of what I've experienced. Yeah, I mean, I, I could maybe, uh, before Richard jumps in, maybe just add uh, one point to, to what Antonis said, which is that what, again, from my experience, what I've found is um, 
generally there is hesitation to put a preprint out because the perception of not having something peer reviewed um, tends to um, not make it serious enough, at least in the in in the community here. And so, and that's important. I completely agree. I think someone asked in the Q and A as well. Peer review is absolutely important and must be done. Preprints are not. Uh, the end of, of a publication process. They are a conduit to, to the end point. Um, and so that's, that's really important. And I guess uh, with these new solutions coming up where review process can be coupled with preprints, for example, I recently came across PCI, uh, which is quite an exciting uh, uh, initiative, uh, although not so much in the microbiology, but we can always maybe start one. But those 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 initiatives will also help maybe adopting preprints a lot more. Uh, but yeah, I, from my side, I have just seen this being a, a point of hesitation for people. Okay, thank you. Richard, maybe we let Anjana just uh, pitch in and then uh, we come back. Sorry, let, let's let uh, Soumya pitch in and then we let you uh, come back, yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points that Antonis, Marco, Richard and Anjana have already made um, and wanted to say, yes, we are seeing differences in adoption of preprints in different communities in different parts of the world. But I think as we address the question of equity, it's really important to also be sensitive to the fact that Scholarly communications, cultures around scholarly communications are different in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as you identify this gap, you try to understand why there's a gap rather than taking a model that has cre that's created a certain degree of comfort and reception in one community, one part of the world that perhaps has very, very elite systems and very established systems and, you know, sort of transfer it to another part of the world that actually has some slightly different needs and requirements. So I think obviously there's a huge, a lot to be done in terms of awareness raising and just building comfort around the world. But I think the point that Anjana made about uh, a nervousness or a reluctance to put information out there that hasn't undergone some initial vetting and gotten some peer review input is, is something that we should sort of think about, right? And I, I suspect that one of the reasons we're seeing this massive uptake and a different geographical spread actually within review is potentially because it's happening in concert with journal submission. And it, it you know, we, we, we don't have any hard data on this yet. We're gonna uh, survey our authors to understand more about their motivation. But in fact, the fact that it happens in concert with an established process might create a degree of, of um, familiarity and comfort with releasing it. It lowers the threshold, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer, Sonia. So Richard, would you like to pitch in? Uh... Yeah, so I mean, I just want one, one, one of the things that struck me about that question is it also relates to a point that um, Marco made earlier. Um, and so I think one thing you have to bear in mind is that scientists, most scientists are fairly conservative bunch. And so, you know, they look to other people who lead by, not all, but, but people who lead by example. And there's things that, that, that um, processes and people they trust. So if you look at the evolution of archive, what happened at first was that it was absolutely dominated by high energy physicists. And to the extent that a lot of people still, when you talk about archive, they say, oh, it's only the high energy physicists. That's not actually true now, but what happened is over the years, the high energy physicists did it. And then slowly kind of like, it was almost like diffusion of the idea to other fields. You found that suddenly the, consent, the condensed matter physicists jumped in and they started doing it. And the proportion of papers that was high energy physics relative became reduced and then the mathematicians and then the uh, computational scientists got going. And actually we've seen something a little bit similar in bioarchive. I mean, you pointed out that the neuroscience is the biggest category now. I mean, it's also the biggest meeting if you think about it. But when we started, that wasn't the case. It was um, genomics, genomics and evolutionary biology. I always used to say they were the high energy physicists of biology. And we had this kind of very similar phenomenon. When you look at the curves for, of adoption of different categories on bioarchive, just like physics, 
they grow. And so you get to a point where suddenly, you know, five years ago, there were no developmental biologists and then suddenly developmental biologists came in and then there were more cell biologists. So I think some of it is just a kind of like the, the natural way that ideas spread. And again, back to this point about some people being by nature conservative, some people being by nature um, uh, uh, early adopters. When we, I mean, I also have the perspective of somebody at Research Institute. When we launched at Colston Harbor Lab, there were faculty members who were really enthused, enthusiastic from day one about bioarchive. And then there were people who thought it was a terrible idea and said that they were never going to put papers on bioarchive. And what's interesting to me is not that, that that's not surprising to me at all. But what int interests me is that the early adopters kept going and some of the people who were skeptical at first are now also posting preprints. So I think it's just about um, uh, gaining trust and, and you know, to learning more and, you know, uh, efforts like ASAP Bio are, are, are critical to this, to, 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 to try and kind of push that, uh, make, make that diffusion happen faster. Yeah. So to, to follow up on, on this point and move into the next question, um, again, I will share a personal opinion that uh, maybe we can discuss upon. It is maybe to drive a more uniform adoption, uh, sort of like a major role will be played by a uh, funding agency or like institutions in you know, implementing uh, policies in their like hiring processes and stuff like that. Um, so is anybody wants to uh, you know, contribute to this <laughs> to this aspect. Um, it looks like Ross. Uh, is there any? Is there yeah, I just wanted to say Dora, Dora, Dora. Um, once the research funders really start implementing the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, once journal names really become embarrassing to mention in grant panels and hiring and tenure promotion, um, think how that will open up uh, the landscape for preprint servers and, and for open access journals and just generally for better scientific communication. Um, I saw one of the people asking questions was asking about that and about journal impact factors. And I think that's, that's really starting to be in the past. I mean, it's lucky that I'm in the UK and much of the UK system has signed up to Dora. We don't necessarily know whether people in grant making panels are actually abiding by Dora. Um, so there'll be a bit of a process to actually enforce compliance of Dora principles, but the world is changing and everyone who keeps saying, oh, but journal impact factors, oh, but journal impact factors. I'm kind of tired of that. That's, that's in the past. Um, certain regions in the world like South Korea, Brazil, certainly still very much are journal impact factor based as far as I know. But um, you know, if you're talking the Dutch system, the UK system, many European countries are really explicitly moving away from journal impact factors and journal names. And Jenna? Yeah, I just uh, I I I want to add one thing to this though from the 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 other side, right? I mean, I think it's really great to think about policies that are going to help the change happen, but. Change also has to come from the researchers. And um, when you're asking for these changes to occur, you're, you, you need to push the researchers to pay attention to the science. And given that there's so much science coming out, it gets hard to parse out, you know, the different types of, of, of outputs that are coming out. And invariably, if not this metric, some other metric gets established and then people go by that. So I, I want to pose a question, sorry, Marco and Yamini, I'm posing a question on top of you guys, but I wanna try and understand how to, beyond policy, also change researchers' outlooks, you know, to, to, to make, the, the change has to come from, from this side as well. And I find that this is a really hard one to change. I, at least personally, in the circles I interact with, I find that that is something that's not going away so quickly. Um, you know, the perceptions of how journals should be and how impact has to be assessed, etc. Yeah, no, I, in my opinion, especially uh, touching on what Ross mentioned, that uh, things are changing, I, I, I do feel that um, uh, a lot of this uh, sort of uh, mindset from uh, researchers, especially early career researchers, is based on sort of myths that were maybe rooted in, you know, decades ago. And sometimes it just takes some courage to uh, uh, act uh, yourself and give it example uh, and, uh, you know, post your major publication on BioArchive uh, without fear uh, to, to move the, you know, the, the vibe forward. But that's my point of view. Um, I don't know, Yamini, if you feel uh, asking more questions or if we should um, um, 
give the microphone to Sara to read some of the Q&A that we have gathered. You're muted, uh, Yamini. Pardon. We have uh, four more minutes for, for wrapping up uh, this roundtable discussion. We can just have an open uh, comment uh, kind of discussion. If any of you would like to pitch in something that you really think is, uh, is burning or, but I really like what Anjana brought up and she said, we go about um, saying that the funding agencies and uh, um, and uh, preprint servers and all other people should be promoting this and we should create awareness and everything. But unless and until um, the researchers themselves give them give them give uh, fellows credit and acknowledge one another's preprint and you know comment and give feedback and discuss, I think change has to come within uh, within us. It's really it's really nice that you comment that. Um, anything else anyone else would like to add? Antonis, would you like to add uh, to that, for example, or um, any other general comment? Um, sure, I, I completely agree with um, Anjana. She makes a great point. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think this is, you know, I'm, I'm now sitting on, um, on assessment panels or promotion and tenure uh, panels. You know, it, it's quite, um, it still shocks me to hear people saying, oh, but they have a paper in so-and-so or they published a book with so-and-so press. And I'm like, so what, you know, did, did you read it? So, so I think we, we really, it's our personal responsibility to, to read the work. Um, you know, in, in our lab, we have a saying that it's the, the paper that makes the journal, not the journal that makes the paper. And so in, in the end of the day, it's, it's you know, what, what you publish and, you know, how you, you interpret the work and um, if it's going to be significant, it's going to be significant whether it stays forever as a preprint or, or whether it's get published in nature, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, you know, you want visibility for your research, you, you want uh, people to get recognized and, and uh, get all the benefits associated with it, but, you know, the, the emphasis should be on the, on the work itself and not on its placement on, you know, a, a fictional scale that's driven by, by outliers. And so I, I completely agree. Um, so, so that's just wanted to, to give a shout out. That's a really important point. All right, with that, I think we can uh, hand over to Sarah, who has curated a list of uh, the audience questions and will uh, project them uh, to you. And yet again, it will be the same format. Any of you who's willing to answer the question can pitch in and answer the audience questions. So over to you, Sarah. Great, thanks a lot, Yamini. I will continue with the questions now. So actually there were a lot of questions um, and I will just pick the first one. So it's about the um, current crisis, which is very interesting. So the question is, since there has been a new explosion in preprinting, especially COVID-related preprints since January, many grant proposals have been written worldwide citing only these instead of journal publications. This means that funding agencies have reviewed proposals only based on preprints. Has MedArchive and preprinting changed peer review of proposals by peer review panels? So traditional funders such as NIH had only encouraged preprints and accepted them on the biosketch and relied on peer reviewed pubs at the just in time materials submission before grant proposal peer review. So is there anyone from the panelists that would like to comment on that? Uh, I guess it's a quite tricky question. Um, I think I feel I've already said too much, but um, I'll just try and do a quick reply to this one. I don't think we could possibly know because the whole thing about the system currently is that most um, grant peer review is done very, very privately. Um, Welcome Trust have recently done a kind of open peer review on grant proposals for the open research proposals and that was really really interesting as a fellow funder looking at that but that's certainly something that perhaps I think we'll see more of in future actually seeing 
um, open grant proposals, open submission of grant proposals, open feedback on grant proposals, particularly during times of COVID-19 when everyone's duplicating the same experiments, we really need to actually um, start the process of open sharing much earlier in the research workflow and have open proposals. Okay. It's an interesting challenge, Sarah, and I think journals too will confront it if they start seeing a large number of articles that are being submitted for formal peer review with the findings based on the preprint literature. Yeah, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to add something or should I move on to the next question? Yes, we can move on. Okay, we can. Yeah, good. Um, so there is another question, which is, um, do the panelists see a way that citations and alternative metrics from preprints and the final published articles are combined or linked in some way to show the whole attention and impact of the research in a better way than it's currently done? Is there anyone who would like to comment on that? Sonia? Um, uh, yeah, I think it's essential, actually, from the perspective of the researcher in particular to show, to aggregate the attention that and citation that a body of work has, has received as it you know, progresses through these different versions and iterations. And I believe that will happen, actually. I believe that the indexers will make that happen. And in fact, I think at least in one of these pilots, that's already happening. I think European CML might already be doing some version of that, but it's certainly on the radar of stakeholders who are, uh, you know, who are invested in, in um, aggregating the uh, citation data. And So for citations, Google Scholar already do this, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, and I think Archive actually does it as well to some extent right i think archive shows the citations that each version receives is that right but in any case it is it is something that's on the collective radar of a number of people because ultimately it's going to be really valuable for a researcher yeah i fully agree thanks a lot for these comments um so I would move on to another question. So there is actually a long comment based on what Somia said, and then a question which is directed to all the panelists. So I think this would be nice to discuss now. Um, so the comment is, thank you, Somia, for bringing up the equity point. I agree that in principle, preprints democratize scholarly dissemination. However, I think there is still a lot of work that needs to be done, both in policy and in cultural change, for that to become a reality. For example, smaller, under-resourced research groups, groups of researchers who have been systematically excluded from the processes of scholarly publication and evaluation, are still disproportionately vulnerable to the act of sharing their results and data early on. And so based on this comment, there is a question to all the panelists. So what do you think would be some ways to truly democratize preprints as a tool of research dissemination across the globe? How can we address the inequity problem as a community at all levels from how research is funded, evaluated and disseminated? Well, let me just say one, one very quick thing. I, I think it's important to, to make the point that Preprints, preprints have accomplished a huge amount of this already. The fact that it's free to post and it's free to read makes it kind of essentially more democratic than anything that exists already. So, I mean, I think one should, one should be very clear that they, it is inherently um, a, a, a step forward in that respect. I don't have a solution, really. Um, I do think that there are things that journals and funders obviously can do. But I take Daniela's point about the fact that researchers, uh, that there is, researchers are not equally vulnerable to, to, uh, to let's say, some of the, you know, bad actors and, and, you know, outcomes around early sharing of research outputs, right? And I think it's really important that all of us recognize that and develop policies and actions that are geared towards focusing on the, 
the most vulnerable, in addition to policies and actions that help advance the ones who are already very advanced, right? Uh, and I suspect that journals will have a role to play in this. Uh, Embo, for example, has an anti-scooping policy, which I'm sure is actually helps uh, researchers in that regard. We don't. Um, uh, it's certainly something that comes up in discussion from time to time. Um, so it's a, it's a really tough problem, uh, I do think. Um, I am very also interested in these academic groups that have sprung up in order to curate the literature. And I think they are quite um, geographically focused at the moment, but one could imagine that if they were to proliferate around the world, and we saw groups in Brazil and Argentina and in India and in China, that that would actually be a way of democratizing how you filter the research, how you select the research that you intend to provide feedback on. Yeah, I've got one small thing that I think we could do. I think um, scientists in the global north could do a much better job of um, reading literature produced by the glo global south and making sure you're very conscious when you're doing a literature search, what tools you're using and what sources those tools include. Because frankly, a lot of tools just miss out journals from the global south and they miss out preprint servers from the global south. And then unsurprisingly, global south literature doesn't get cited. Um, and you can just do that with a little bit more awareness about what your, your, the tool you're using actually searches. Make sure that your searches are as inclusive as possible. That's very easy for me to say as a biodiversity scientist. Most of biodiversity in the world is in the tropics. So one really should go, be going out of one's way to be searching Latin American journals, Southeast Asian journals, because that's actually where the real knowledge about tropical biodiversity is going to be and not necessarily in some journal published in the USA. Um, so the, the, as individuals, we can do things to counter this, which is by reading and citing more widely um, than we traditionally used to do with just lazy web of knowledge searches or scopus searches. And these, these kind of databases are very selective and don't actually include everything that's out there. Thank you, Ross, for this comment. This was really interesting. Do you have also uh, recommendations for tools that might be more inclusive or that should be used because they include more literature than the... Sure. Um, so there's lens.org, um, which is a very good search engine, free, free search engine, which I think has quite a wide scope of journals and papers, possibly preprints as well. Um, then I think also DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, and just generally being aware that there's a wide landscape of preprint servers. And I don't know actually of a good search engine across preprint servers at the moment. I think that's urgent work to be done. Someone needs to build a proper indexer, uh, search engine, APIs, whatever, across all of the preprint servers, because there aren't that many preprint servers. And, and they do have kind of similar underlying technologies behind most of them. So it should be doable, but the fact it hasn't really been done is quite sad. Yeah, like this is something that I have kept in mind and uh, across uh, a number of questions that, uh, that uh, we discussed so far. And I wasn't asking because I wasn't myself aware if there is already such a tool, but it seems there is not. And it seems that could be a priority. Richard? Um, just one, I mean, I, I don't know the spectrum of servers they cover, but it, uh, you know, one of the question we're often asked about Bioarchy is how how can you search, search bioarchive and sci-archive and archive, for example? So it's worth mentioning that Google Scholar already searches multiple sites. Microsoft Academic also searches multiple servers. And the interesting thing about that is that Google, Google Scholar and Microsoft Academic and Meta will all search journals and preprint servers so that you can go and, you know, you can sort of slice and dice in different ways. Now, you know, I mean, the choices the inclusion choices they make is a different question and they will have their reasons for, for doing that. I mean, I think that that's a challenge for anyone who builds one of these tools is that, you know, I, I we thought very hard when we launched the Med Archive about our inclusion criteria for papers. Um, there are venues out there um, mentioning their names that clearly don't think in the same way. And this is why we're very careful for the clinical information so it wouldn't surprise me if the people who, if one, of, one of the challenge as a search engine, be, be you Google Scholar or Microsoft Academic or a new thing that the like which Ross is proposing is what 
what do you include? There are lots of things that will describe themselves as preprint servers. There's lots of things that will describe what they put on their sites as preprints. And I would just say that, that, that there are definitely um, sites that are posting new material that we would never put on BioArchive or MedArchive for, for reasons. So if you're an aggregator, you need to think about that. And it's, it's, not, it's not an easy answer because you know, just because BioArchive doesn't want, well, doesn't want the paper, it doesn't mean that nobody should want it. But that there may, may be instances where BioArchive doesn't want the paper and no one on earth should post that thing because it's dangerous, et cetera. And so that's, that's going to be really, really, really hard. And, and, and people won't like some of the answers. I suspect the fact that, I don't know how many of you are f familiar with the fixra.org, has everybody heard of that? That's set up basically because they think that all the stuff in archive is biased. You know, um, pro tip, it's not biased, but it's, it's where you get crazy stuff. So, you know, I think that's, that's something you have to think about. Thanks a lot. So I see that Somia still wants to add something. And after that, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. I think I just wanted to, I think, I think Richard has touched on a, on a really interesting point that has come up now in a number of different conversations, which is, what is a preprint server, right? Um, and I, you know, a number of different conversations that I've been involved in come back to this fundamental question of, well, what is a preprint server? And has the community now reached a point where we can actually say, well, in order to be a preprint server, you have to have these, these three features. One of them is quality control screening, right? And so database repositories may allow you to post up a manuscript, but are they preprint servers? They're a repository. So I think, you know, I think that is a question that the community will need to grapple with in some way at some point. Yeah, you're right. So thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts, Sonia. Unfortunately, we already have to wrap up now, but there are still a lot of interesting questions in the Q&A, so we will try to respond to all of them in a blog post. And I would like to hand over now again to Marco and Yamini to close the session. So thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and thank you, audience, for these uh, very interesting questions. And the panelists have answered them uh, excitingly and interestingly, and uh, it has been an enriching experience. First of all, we'd first like to thank the um, uh, ASAP Bio uh, fellows and all the um, organizers, Sarah and um, Bradley, who have been in the, in the involvement of the organization, and also other fellows uh, who gave us infographics and, uh, um, and helped with the slides. In addition to that, Iratse and uh, Jessica have, uh, have been great help uh, in setting up this entire uh, uh, panel discussion and thank you for this opportunity uh, to both of them and for further questions and comments on this panel discussion please direct them to Iratse and uh, there are the details uh, to contact Iratse and now uh, for one last um, uh, further information I'd like to hand over to Iratse. Yeah, thank you, Yamini. Uh, I would just like to briefly echo the thanks to everyone who was involved in preparing this um, panel. Obviously, the, the five fantastic panelists, thank you for such interesting insights. I, I for myself, I thought that I knew quite a bit about preprints, but I've learned new things, so thank you. Uh, thank you to the four fellows that were involved in organizing this, Mark and Yamini, who Sarah, uh, whom you've seen through the Q&A session, and Bradley, who has been uh, very actively live tweeting um, and help also organize. So thanks to all of you. Uh, and obviously thanks to all of the attendees for listening and for the interesting questions and comments. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, as you mentioned, feel free to contact me. My email address is there. Uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to make a brief mention to this other event that Ace of Bio uh, has recently announced. We are going to be running a design sprint on incentivizing preprint curation and review. We've um, heard from uh, several of the speakers today about the interest in uh, preprint reviews. Uh, so what we are going to be doing in this event uh, is to encourage anyone who has ideas, suggestions, uh, projects that they think 
could drive further visibility or activity around preprint review to submit proposals. Um, and then the, the event will run on two sessions, the first one on November 13th, where we will review the proposals, and then there will be an opportunity to further revise the proposals based on the feedback at the session or afterwards, uh, with a second session on December the 3rd to um, award some uh, token prizes to hopefully support those projects going forward. So the information is on our website, uh, feel free to have a look, and if you have any ideas, please do submit a proposal. Uh, and with that, that's it for today. Thank you so much again to everyone for participating. And I hope you have a nice rest of the day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thank you.